Welcome back, uh, everyone. Hope you had a great summer and didn't lose uh, too much luggage in your travels. Uh, the show has a great fall and winter lineup, but I wanted to start with two of my favorite, my personal favorite lawyers, two lawyers with endless smiles, great senses of humor, flawless poise, oodles of success in both their professional and family life. And I'm so grateful that both of you have uh, joined me today. Uh, Wendy asked me uh, yesterday if there was anything she could do to prepare, as did Cheryl. And I said to Wendy uh, that after I finished talking about their accomplishments and qualifications, uh, there would be no time left for any content. And I heard a big few <laughs> at the end. Let's start with Cheryl. How Cheryl fits everything into a day or a month or a year for that matter is beyond my comprehension and find time to listen to the back uh, backstreet boys. <laughs> uh, Cheryl's a civil litigator and mediator and a bencher who consistently ranks first in votes. She's on a number of venture committees and she served most importantly on the equity uh, diversion and inclusion uh, committee. Uh, Cheryl was the recipient of, of uh, business in Vancouver's top 40 under 40 award. And I asked Cheryl if I could be a uh, qualify for the top 60 over 60 <laughs> award. Uh, I didn't get an answer right yet from her. Uh, Cheryl won the Canadian Lawyer Magazine's Excellence Award in the category of Female Trailblazer 2021, past president of the Vancouver Bar Association. She's been on numerous CBA committees, including solo and small firms, and a UBC lecturer. I'm sure that I left out a number of accomplishments, including the most important from my point of view, and that was a great mom. And I know this as her office was right across the hallway from mine. And there was this very large, messy, dedicated space for her little boy with toys all over the place. You may hear Cheryl talk about the many challenges we have as lawyers, but I never forget, and I'll never forget the giant smile always on her face walking down Hornby Street with her son in his stroller. Wendy's career is also unique. Wendy is an international tax specialist, uh, earned a master's in business administration, and completed uh, the advanced management uh, program at Harvard. Uh, Wendy's expertise, as much as anyone in this province, is in-house counsel for large corporations, including, and one of the reasons why I wanted Wendy on the show, is her responsibilities for social, environmental, uh, governments and governance and sustainability, a big challenge today uh, for resource-based and other companies. Uh, Wendy has served on a number of boards, including West Point Ray Academy. Uh, she's been a director of Via Rail and chair of the strategy committee of the Vancouver Police Foundation. Also board of director of the Royal BC Museum and how one becomes a director of the BC Royal <laughs> Museum is beyond me, but I won't ask you about that, okay? Uh, Wendy is Senior VP, Legal Risk and Governance for Capstone um, Copper. Wendy was the first female president of the Vancouver Club, and I know she's a bit worried what I'm going to say next, <laughs> and engineered the reforms necessary to modernize its functions, including its bars. Uh, because of our special guests membership uh, or special guests uh, presidency of the club, women's membership alone uh, or spousal increased from 30 to near a thousand. And I understand that the parties also increased ex exponentially <laughs> after your reign began there. Wendy has three children. Uh, there are no strollers. They're all in their mid twenties. Both of you are amazing lawyers who have consistently year after year faced difficult questions of balancing life, work, and family. And that's really why I wanted you both here. In 2019, in an article in Economy, Law, and Politics, uh, Cheryl, you said that your prof toughest professional decision was trying to juggle family and work. And every day there are elements of challenges, but there are also huge elements of rewards. So allow yourself to change as you experience new things. And I think that last sentence was, was in bold. Uh, in 2017, in an article in BC Business, 
Wendy talked about her role model, Anne Giardini, a lawyer, former president of Weyerhaeuser and chancellor of SFU, and how Anne was able to balance her life with her kids and her very demanding numerous jobs. So I'm gonna ask both of you, what's the secret to all this? Cheryl, I'll start with you. I don't know if there is a secret, Jeff. I mean, I think for me, it's been about staying really true to what works for me and my family and my firm at that time. And part of what I'm getting at when I say allow yourself to change your mind is you need a little bit of space some breathing room to see who you grow into as a lawyer, what um, you enjoy practicing, what hours you want to work, what just what you envision for yourself, um, what your family needs are, what your firm needs are, um, and then allowing yourself to change course as you need to. I think that um, for a lot of people, there's stress when you're trying to stay on the course that you set for yourself in law school. Okay. And, and I agree, Cheryl, there's a lot of truth to that. And I think also being highly enabled at home really helps if you're in a career where it's very time consuming. You want to love what you do. You want everyone on your team to love what they do, but you have to recognize that you need, they need that life balance as well. And it's too easy uh, if they're passionate about their work to devote too much time to it and it's not sustainable. So you really need to ensure that you are enabled at home. You have, and that starts with early, early on choice and spouse choice and significant other. Choose someone who's going to support your drive in your career. Um, because I have a lot of friends who are um, great lawyers, very dedicated, but uh, their spouse was an extra child. <laughs> so <laughs> it didn't work. It, it just didn't work in terms of the uh, career path that they may have otherwise chosen. And so they chose to uh, take a long period out or stay home. And that that's great as well. Um, but if you know that you want to stay in your career, have your family balance it all, then you need to make sure you have help at home, uh, which in some cases means having some people choose to have kids a little later when they can afford the support because early on in a career, it's hard to have that support. Um, and also having a spouse who with a career and willing to support your career as well. It always, I always wondered on a practical, practical level, how can there be that much time in a day to accomplish and do what each of you have accomplished? Uh, I can tell you that when I, and I've known both of you for a while, I always thought uh, I'm alone. This is me. I've been able to accomplish what I wanted in my career. How would I do it on a practical level day to day if I was one of you two? and engaged in the kinds of things that you're engaged in. So I just wonder on a day-to-day -day basis, how does this work? Not a lot of sleep. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Yeah, and he's not having a lot of sleep. Using every minute, I'd say. And I don't watch TV. I don't know, do you find I do you... love TV. But... Oh, okay. <laughs> I, I, I find I'll binge watch something occasionally or on vacation, but yeah. I don't usually in the evening turn on the TV. I, yeah. I usually spend time with the kids in the evening, through dinner and then I work when they're and my kids aren't I know I know I'm the right age for them to be mid-20s but they're um two or 13 and one is 16 so they're still in so school. someone wrote something somebody wrote something about you that was an error <laughs> and in fact, you're, age, you're going to remind me that a lot was an error afterwards <laughs> So, so they're in the high school phase now. So it changes and you're right. It's about being flexible. So when they're young, that's when it's really tough. They yeah. need you and they want you there when you go leave. It's so amazing. You, it sounds like you took your son to the office. I, I took him everywhere with me. Would Jeff would have seen that for sure. Yeah. Um, but it was a lot of that flexibility, you know, taking him to the aquarium and things like that in the morning when that worked for him, working during nap time. And that's, that's amazing because being there for the kids is a gift for them it really is i took a slightly different path and i um, had help at home and i worked um so i wasn't and i wasn't in a position at that point where i could bring them to work so it was hard you 
you tell yourself you're being a role model, so it's great for them, <laughs> but you do miss some of those occasions. So I love the approach you took with the flexibility and, and choosing a different path. And I, it sounds like that's going out on your own. You started a, uh, yeah, which is with, huge. With my spouse, yeah. That's huge. Yeah. And that, so that flexibility of choose, I, I did go in-house, which I think to some made it easier in-house, more flexibility, but uh, not as courageous as, as you. So how important is it for young lawyers who intend on doing some of the things that both of you have done to ensure that their work arrangements are flexible? It depends. So if, if they want to have a family, you need to make sure that uh, you you need you need to have the flexibility, and you need to look for a boss, who or a leader, who understands that. Um, and I did find that in Anne Giardini when I worked with her. She was a decade older. She her kids were about a decade ahead. So following through, and she understood she understood that, and so that was that was really a gift for me. Um, in terms of even when I went on maternity leave, uh, the flexibility there, uh, which might I might not have found in in with a different leader, and then for me it's been really important to play that forward with women who've um, been on my team and who are currently on my team, and it comes back tenfold in productivity. If you give your uh, team flexibility and you because you care about them and their life outside of work they work that much harder when you're sure. but when you're applying for an interview in a big firm can you talk about that kind of stuff okay i've had some interesting experiences well, i've there. heard about a lot of interesting i've had some interesting experiences. current ones so someone um i've had the situation where someone i was interviewing someone and they were really upfront with me and told me that they were, um, they wanted to have more kids and they wanted, okay. they planned to, they, they just wanted to put it on the table and they wanted to um, have a certain amount of time for maternity leave. I was okay with that uh, because they were an excellent candidate uh, and I know we can work through it and uh, find workarounds, second where needed. Um, and that person has turned out to be an excellent hire, excellent hire, um, and their child's uh, a taller now. So it, I think that that flexibility really pays off as a leader in an, for an organization as well. Cheryl, Cheryl, as a venture, you must have encountered a, a questions that are consistent with this line of questioning. Definitely. Yeah, how do you and deal with that? Even honestly, even before I yeah. was a venture, Jeff, because yeah. um, I started working remotely when I had my son way before COVID. So way before people were working remotely as frequently as they are now. So I did get a lot of questions about that, the juggling, the blurring of boundaries in the day and all of that kind of thing. Um, and uh, often when I'm talking to people, I've explained to them, it's become about asking for what I need and feeling okay to ask for that. Um, and it's taken me a while to get there. I wouldn't say that I was able to do it from day one and not feeling a little bit nervous about it. Um, because um, I'm a business owner and um, I needed to be still involved in the firm right after my um, son was born, there was no maternity leave option for me, right? And so um, there was um, a discovery that I had to do um, not long after he was born. Um, and so um, my mom did come and help me that day because I needed to be there for that client. Um, and I remember having to ask during the break because they said, well, can we just go through the lunch break, uh, which normally is fine for everybody. And I said, actually, I, I have to go and I have to nurse. And I was feeling very you know, apprehensive. Do I say something? Do I not? Um, and um, everybody in the room was so supportive. Of course, how long, do, you know, how much time do you need it? My client already knew, you know, how much time do you need? We'll do whatever you'd like. We can happily accommodate. Um, and it's, you need situations like that to kind of boost you to the next one. So you can start to feel comfortable asking for what you need. 
Um, but uh, it, I'm very honest that it didn't come naturally and easily to start asking, um, but it gets better. So if a young lawyer asked either of you, how open should I be in my interview with the firm I want to be part of? How open should I be? How open can I be? What do you say? Cheryl? <laughs> um, <laughs> um, Sorry, I said I wouldn't ask any tough questions. No, I'll, I, and I'm happy to all respond, I'll answer too. But I know that's a toughie. I think that it depends maybe on how quickly you might be looking to do some of those things, right? If it's down the road or within the next year or two. Um, and if it's sooner, um, maybe selecting a firm that has someone at it who has been speaking about these issues or um, you know uh, is a supporter of somebody going through these issues, but it can be very difficult. Um, uh, and I think it's about fit on mm -hmm. both sides, right? Kind of similar to what Wendy was saying. Um, when I do interviews, I'm happy to mention the playroom. I'm happy to mention the flexibility and things like that. So I think it goes both ways um, in finding that fit. Yeah, absolutely. It, and I would be cautious um, and make sure you know who you're speaking to, what the culture in the firm is. Um, and do your research on the, the people who are interviewing you as well. And I think you'll get a good sense of, of whether you're comfortable disclosing that. I, I think um, I know the first time I interviewed for a firm, I took off my wedding ring because I was young and I didn't want them thinking, oh, she's going to go get pregnant. She's married. Because I used to hear that all the time. Well, I heard it, I heard I it heard, the other day. Yeah, I hear that. So I, now I would not do that now. But well, I wouldn't do I've it been now right after the honeymoon either. <laughs> that wouldn't go over very well. Okay, but anyways. Uh, so, yeah, there are absolutely lots of stories from the past. I think things have changed a lot. Um, and is you, you need to know your, your value. Know your worth. Communicate it. And if there's a need and you feel that you want to discuss personal issues like that in an interview, that's fine. But don't feel that you need to, even if you are planning um, to have a family, you don't need to discuss that. So um, it's a question for both of you. What would you say to a young lawyer who approached you despondently and said, I just can't do it all. And when I say it all, I mean all of the things that both of you have done. I don't wanna feel like a terrible parent. I don't wanna feel like an absentee spouse. And I'm getting anxious about the position that I find myself in uh, and starting to suffer anxiety. What do you say to a young lawyer who says that to you? Well, I do get some of these types of I know, questions. I know you do, yeah. Um, uh, I do very often talk to lawyers about LAP. Um, uh, the Lawyer's Assistance Program. Um, I think that LAP is an invaluable resource. Um, I also um, try to help lawyers um, sort of break it down into smaller um, tasks. Uh, and sometimes that's day to day. Okay, what am I going to accomplish today? What's on my list of priorities for today? Because sometimes it is overwhelming when you look at what you have to get done that month um, and see how it goes. You know, if you've got something, a family commitment on Tuesday, okay, that's taking Tuesday. So what do you need to work on um, in the office on Wednesday and try to go step by step, week by week, um if that helps uh, so so it's not so overwhelming yeah yeah wendy do you have anything to add to that yeah and and reach out for help mm -hmm. reach out for help uh, we're seeing a lot more pressure and as a result anxiety in younger mm -hmm. lawyers than i think or certainly than i experienced and i saw around me at the time that i was a younger lawyer uh, I think the pressure is, it starts earlier. It's starting, you're seeing it in the high schools. Mm -hmm. You're seeing the pressure, the anxiety. Now it's so much harder to get into law school. And then it's so much harder to get to the next stage that um, that's being carried through. And there's a lot of uh, expectations 
financial costs mm-hmm. um, on on young lawyers. And so there is the support system. Mental health is a big focus now in a lot of organizations, or it should be if it's not. And it's important to reach out, find a mentor for for many reasons. A mentor in your career is very, very important. And find the right fit in a mentor. Don't be afraid to go and ask them. When someone you admire, don't be afraid to ask them to be a mentor. There's a lot of senior lawyers who would be happy to mentor someone. So um, having that support, asking for help when you need it, and in terms of having a lot of work, overwhelming, stacked up, start with the things every morning. One of a uh, former CEO, I remember him telling me this, start every day with the things you do not want to do. I don't know if that applies in family law, Wendy Jane. <laughs> okay. It works for I'm me. Not sure the you, things I'm procrastinating Wendy, on, I try I'm to I'm not sure you want to make that phone call that you don't want to make at 8.30 a.m. to start your day, okay? <laughs> Obviously, who you talk to had never been in that business. <laughs> no, no. No. Uh, Wendy, what you just said uh, leads me to my next uh, question. Uh, in a recent International Bar Association Young Lawyers Report, Uh, the two most cited negative factors about what we do are lack of mentors, as you mentioned, and difficulties balancing life and work. Uh, Both of you have been lucky enough to, and myself, to have readily accessible, highly respected members of the bar as uh, mentors. But what if you're not that lucky? And uh, Cheryl, as you and I talked about the other day, what a with the increase in sole practitioners and the isolation that that can cause, uh, there's simply no one to talk to. And we all know we need to talk to somebody about what we do. What steps can people take? Um, So I'd say, again, when I get this question, Jeff, I'm always encouraging people to attend legal events, start making those connections as in a way that they feel comfortable. Not everybody's ready to go to every event, talk to 15 lawyers there, hand out cards. It might just be going to the event the first time, right? And then the second time going and saying, I'm gonna talk to two people this time and starting small in a way um, that they're comfortable. Um, And one of the other questions I get about making connections in the bar um, and how, how does it work when you don't come from a family that's very connected to begin with. I'm a first generation Canadian. Um, I really wanted to be a lawyer. My first job when I was uh, around 18, I think, was a um, photocopy clerk in a law firm so that I could see what it was like. Um, And I kept those friendships, I kept those connections. um, And I share those stories um, with people um, because you know, yes, now I'm a bencher. I do know a lot of lawyers. Um, It didn't start that way, right? And it took me a long time to um, to sort of cultivate friendships and relationships. It's a lot of hard work, proving myself, all of that along the way. Um, And then continuing to keep those friendships going as things get busy, um, as best as you can, Um, you know, even if it's a quick email to say hello, et cetera. Um, So, in, you know, going back to building connections, it takes a while. Um, and everybody's starting from a different point. We're going to get to your your words about it takes a village. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to get there. But Wendy, although you're in-house counsel and have been for years, but you have worked with law firms, what do law firms have to do to make their young associates feel less disillusioned? I think there's a lot of progress being made. Yeah. Um, and it, of course, it's firm dependent, but uh, I know there is a big focus. We work with a lot of external firms. And so I do take the time to find out what they are doing in terms of mentoring. And I follow the programs that they have because that's important in selecting external firms as well, that they really support um, diversity as well as uh, work life balance. And um, the, the firms that we do work with, I, I see, I've seen a lot of change over the last 10 years. Um, and so I think to further that, 
along um, more, maybe more programs in terms of uh, certain stages of life. I know a lot of young female lawyers who've had issues around starting a family. And so that is something where I think the firms can be very supportive when there's challenges there in terms of time um, and understanding. So, and I have seen some firms do that. In fact, I was asked to speak at one of the um, sessions um, that I think the Law Society had put it on, but it was organized by one of the firms. Um, and it had a huge turnout of young women who were at that stage who were having challenges with starting a family. Okay. I always wanted to ask you this. Don't worry, it has nothing to do with the <laughs> Vancouver Club. <laughs> Madam President, um, what what informed you to be in house counsel? Why did I decide yeah, to, yeah. to be in house counsel? Yeah. Well, I went to law school. Originally, I was going to do an MBA, and at the time that I was finishing my undergrad, it seemed that companies were becoming a bit disillusioned with MBAs. I don't want to date myself, so I won't give the year. So, um, and I was teaching, I started out teaching SATs, and then I started teaching LSATs for this company called the Princeton Review. And I thought, oh, I'll write the LSAT since I've been teaching it. Um, and I was interested in law. And then I, the more I learned about it, the more interested I became and thought this will be a growth route into business. So my goal was 10 years in law to really get a good base in um, legal understanding and then move into business. So uh, third year law, absolutely love tax. No idea I would love to it. And so I decided I wanted to do tax and I went and did the master's in international tax. So I'm practicing in that area. And then an opportunity came up to, on a six month comment to go to um, Weyerhaeuser for maternity replacement. And within a, within a few weeks, I signed on full-time permanent I this is what I want to do I love the mix of business it was it's so, so I've never gone strictly into business now but I my day-to-day -day work a lot of it is the business side rather than the legal side well uh, is a lot of your work corporate governance I I have uh corporate governance is definitely a big piece of it um and then I do enterprise risk management yeah. um and uh, global insurance, which is tied to risk. And now um, in the last few years, I've taken on our ESG strategy yeah. or sustainability yeah, well, strategy. Yeah, I'm gonna get to that uh, later because that's so important. So Cheryl, as I mentioned to you yesterday, uh, and you mentioned to me, one of the most important things that kept me happy in my career was uh, my wonderful colleagues. Mm -hmm. And I give them all a shout out now because I couldn't have done what I did without them. And I, and in a 2021 blog, you wrote, <laughs> in the midst of COVID, you said that it takes a village to have a happy career in law. Can you tell us about that? Sure. Um, my friends are everything. My law friends are everything. Um, I'm still in very good touch with um, my law school friends. Um, I met my spouse in first year law, uh, <laughs> um, but they have been such a support um, the whole way through. Summer articling, articling, I mean, everybody's been there, right? Where they are assigned a memo, they don't know what, the, what it actually means. They're feeling stressed about it. They just wanna go and sit with people who understand and are feeling that same stress at that time. Um, and they were definitely that for me. Um, and you know, in, even in terms of when I wanted to take on roles with the Vancouver Bar Association um, or um, the Bencher uh, role, uh, just huge support from those classmates. Um, and so it's made a world of difference for me. Is there any isolation, Wendy, in, in being in-house counsel in terms of um, uh, relationships with your peers? No, uh, it's great. We have general counsel networks, mm -hmm. general counsel roundtables. Uh, I work a lot with external specialists. Uh, one thing I did early on, was uh, joined the subsection and then I uh, got very involved with the Bar Association and 
the corporate counsel section. So that also created a network. And then over time, you just, you have great friends who are GCs you call up, or if you need documents, uh, bounce ideas off. And uh, it's, it's definitely not isolating. As I imagine sole practitioners or small firms uh, may have a lot more challenges. We, we've talked about mental health and work-life balance. However, and, and Wendy, you brought this up, so many young lawyers have concerns about the environment and sustainability. Uh, and as I mentioned earlier in 2019, the governance professionals of Canada uh, met here in Vancouver to discuss just those things, the environment, social governance, and sustainability issues as they related to board uh, boards of director, di uh, directors, which you're intimately knowledgeable about. <laughs> Uh, it was determined, I understand, at that conference that climate change, income inequality, ethical practices, and truth and reconciliation uh, should now be addressed yes. by boards, as I understand it. So, Wendy, as an expert in, in corporate governance, how do large corporations, particularly resource-based ones, deal with those kinds of problems I just talked about? As a, very, as a very high priority. Yeah. So of all my, uh, or the, some of the functions that I manage, one of the primary focuses for me right now is environmental social governance. Uh, top of our strategy list is climate change, uh, diversity and inclusion, biodiversity, um, and people and communities. So a lot of companies, it's it, a lot of resources are being dedicated to this, and it's a tone from the top, tone from the top, absolute um, mandate, because you need resources, you need resources in order to, and it's not something you can implement overnight. You do see some companies um, putting out their strategy and their sustainability reports very quickly. You have to do it responsibly fast. You can't do it that quickly. It's a lot of work. Well, that's what I was going to ask you. How do you deal with those things in an expeditious fashion that's quite required now or quite expected? You you make it a priority, but you do it in stages and you put a lot of time and resources to it. But our strategy has been uh, 15 months in the making so far, and we haven't rolled it out yet. We're, we will be rolling it out at the end of this year but it takes that long to do it right. Um, and in terms of the climate, you have to have a baseline of your emissions, and then you have to have strategies that are actually practical uh, and achievable for decarbonization. So you have to develop those pathways. So it, it's a, a lot of external expertise you need to bring in, and you need to take the time. Everybody has a day job, as well, the sites, the operations all have day jobs. They're very busy, but you have to dedicate the time. And, and that's why you need the tone from the top of, in terms of importance. And um, it's something that companies have to do and should want to do. And, it, and that, in turn, attracts talent. So you mentioned young lawyers. Companies, I think, now need a social purpose. If you want to attract top talent, the younger generation, you need to have a purpose, a social purpose. It can't be all profit, but it has to be balanced with profit too, because the company has to be profitable. But I think those the just change in that values and focus in terms of environmental and social governance is um, critical going forward. And, and you see it from investors. Investors are demanding it as well from the companies. And there's a lot of funds out there that will only invest in high-performing uh, companies on the ESG side. High-performing ethical. What ethical. Used to call ethical. ESG. Companies. Exactly. ESG. Exactly. Yeah. Is there anything you want to add to that? Cheryl, I was going to ask this question. So what steps can a young lawyer make to make a difference in all of those kinds of issues that Wendy just talked about, income inequality, uh, ethical practices, truth and reconciliation issues? Because that's what young lawyers want to be involved in now. Yeah, um, there's so much learning 
that has to be done. Um, and I think that um, there are a lot of courses, the Law Society has the um, Truth and Reconciliation course now. There are a lot of courses um, that we can all take um, uh, to, I think, become more aware of what we can do, what has happened, what we can do. Um, but it's all of us. It's not just young lawyers. I think it's all of us. Yeah. Okay. You, and you're including me in that? <laughs> Listen, ah, now is the fun part. I have some rapid fire questions for both of you. Okay. Uh, I want you both to answer the same question. And I did not tell you, everyone out there, what I was going to ask. Okay? okay. What are you currently reading or streaming? Now, when I asked that question, I thought it was a silly question because I assumed that you had enough time on your hands <laughs> after all the stuff I've talked about to do this. So, is it a silly question? No, I did. I said I occasionally binge watch something. So I just started watching Imposters. Okay. And I know you listen to the Backstreet Boys. Yeah, I do. What else? I know how what you are you know currently that. reading? Are you currently reading or streaming anything? Well, if I'm going to be really honest, um, I'm reading the National Geographic Kids Book of Why right now. That's what my son and I are reading every night. That's my big thing that we're doing. But it was pause. Paw Patrol for a really Paw long Patrol. time. Yeah. You know about Paw Patrol? I do. Okay. <laughs> that was the, yeah. Okay. Now we talked about, and I think somebody said this, was it you, Wendy, or you, Cheryl? What was your first job? And I'll tell you, I'm going to be transparent and tell everybody out there. My first job was a buggy, was a buggy boy at Oak Ridge in the parking lot for $2.85 an hour in grade 12, which was a huge amount. And I had to wear a, uh, a toque, we used to call them, or a cap, because my hair was down to here, and I didn't want anybody to see. That was my first job. Wendy? My first job was in what is now the Lululemon building, just before the Broad Street Bridge, ah. a big brick building. I was in grade 11 or 12, and it was a night job, and I was a telemarketer for, I believe it was Rogers selling and I found a way we were supposed to be selling pay TV but it was a hard sell but you could give it away free if somebody was moving and getting their cable hooked up because it was a free <laughs> trial but it came with I forgot this until you just asked <laughs> it came with a um it came with a cost in terms of installing it so I got all the realty <laughs> Wendy's still Please. marketing. It sounds like she's still marketing this thing. I found out who was moving, called them, and said, I can give you this for free. So, anyway. We talked about it. <laughs> yeah. That was That's my first great. job. That's yeah. great. So, who inspires you most? Uh, still, you still stuff. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Wendy? Oh, what inspires you most? Or who? I think there's a lot. I've had a number, I've been fortunate to have a number of mentors who are incredibly inspiring to me, uh, both male and female. Including one who lives in Rome in, right now. Including one who, and, and one sitting here. <laughs> <laughs> and and uh, I also, I think the thing I'm the proudest of, which really drives me, it, are my three kids. They're younger than I said. But anything, yeah. <laughs> the three in high school. So, uh, I've, all my anything I've accomplished, they are the one I'm the most proud of. Okay. All right. I think I know the answer to this question. What's your favorite song of all time? <laughs> this is this is really hard because uh, there's so many good ones. Okay, and now you have time to think about that. <laughs> I'm going to say I want it that way. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I have. It's always something current. Oh, is it? I don't have an old time favorite. Oh, okay. <laughs> Are you dodging question? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, I'm, gonna, I'm going deeper than that, Wendy. Okay. <laughs> no, I know you well enough. What's your favorite love song of all time? Oh, oh. I don't think I know any love okay. songs. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> if you could do your career again differently, is there anything, anything at all you would do differently? No. Okay. No, even the mistakes. Mm -hmm. Because I think I learned from them. So, um, no, I wouldn't change anything in life. Okay. What's your favorite restaurant food, Wendy King? My favorite restaurant food? Restaurant food. food. Uh, Italian. Okay. 
Mr. So searching for a verse. Again, so many options, but I'm gonna say chocolate mousse because I can never make it as okay. good myself. Right. <laughs> Last question. What do both of you do to totally chill? I don't, that's, this that, is the I, hardest in my, so far. <laughs> so if I'm on vacation laying by a pool, which sounds fantastic, I'm usually reading work. Mm -hmm. So I, I can, but that, that, I find that relaxing because then you're, so you're on an island in on... Greece reading about governance. <laughs> Technical reading. I find it, or, or just working in a relaxing space. Yeah. I find it's very relaxing because you're then um, getting on top, getting ahead. Well, I mean, similar to Wendy, I think going back full circle to what we started with, with the whole balance, um, there tends to not be any full chilling time, yeah. right? right? And so it's a bit of everything all the time, but I love it. You love it, okay. Well, I wanna thank you both. This is a bit of my dream come true, having <laughs> interviewed you both, <laughs> because all of us, all three of us, I think have had a, uh, some kind of natural connection over the years that we all respected uh, each other uh, professionally. And, and got along uh, socially so well. Uh, for everyone who's watched, thank you. We'll see you all again in two weeks with special guest uh, Sharon Sutherland uh, to talk about all types of uh, conflict resolution. And thank you all uh, for watching. And thanks again to my great guests. Mm -hmm.